You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. Andy's been with me from the start, the very, very first class um, that I ever taught life design. Uh, he was the first guy I reached out to. But I think um, what I'd like to kind of, as my introduction to Andy, and something I'd encourage you is, um, I mean, I have lots of friends, but I have, I think if you are really honest with yourself, you probably only have, if you're truthful when you talk good friends, you can probably only count them on one or two hands at most. Um, I mean, the kind of people you really spend time with, really invest in. And, uh, and I've been fortunate, I've collected them, and you know, Andy and Nate and Chris Grebner and some of these people you've seen come through here are those, are those folks. And why that's, why that's important is that uh, you know, every, every major decision, everything I've been thinking about, every kind of crossroads, I gather these people together and I pick their brains. Um, when I started teaching this class, uh, Andy doesn't even realize this, or maybe he does, um, where the whole idea of life design the name of it even came from was Andy. We were sitting at uh, the Java house. Uh, I was telling him about this idea of an idea of a class I wanted to teach. And he says, well, you kind of like, it's kind of like a life design, isn't it? And I knew that's what it would be called. Um, when, I, uh, when I went to, uh, to Las Vegas, I gathered all the guys, you know, Nate and Andy and, and Chris and all that in my living room to talk about what that would be and what I could get out of it. Uh, when I did the reimagining down, down class, not only was, was Andy, um, part of the, the thought process by Boo Ford, but he would come, we called him the social entrepreneur in residence. He would show up for every class, went to Vegas with us, and was as important to the success of the class as anybody. And now he, uh, he's from at Cornell. Um, so uh, he told me, so I've been gone, as you know, I've been in Vegas for about two years. And so I haven't heard Andy, Andy took what he started doing in here and took it like on the road. And so what you're seeing is what he does at college campuses everywhere. So I told him go out for a couple of years, come back when he's ready. So that's what you guys got today. So, um, so if you could give uh, Andy a warm welcome. It's always really hard to open a Dave Gould class because he makes you about want to cry before you get introduced. If you learn one thing from this man, learn from him how to be kind and giving and caring. Uh, I learn that every day from Dave. Uh, it is humbling to be on a list of speakers uh, like Nate Staniforth, one of my best friends, uh, Ben Millen, who you haven't even seen next week, who is literally the guy I want to be when I grow up. Um, and then to have the opportunity to come and speak to you all is such a a pleasure. I, 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 I love this class because of what it stands for uh, and what it means and the opportunity and the point you're at, you're at in your life. Um, I just came from teaching a course, my first course teaching by myself. I didn't have my Dave Gould crutch because we worked together on a class uh, up at Cornell. Some of my students have come here uh, to join, so thanks for that. Uh, I had to bribe them with extra credit, but they're here. Um, so I literally finished, finished my class, jumped in a car, drove straight here, parked, and as you all saw, walked in exactly at the beginning of class. So I get to feel what your life must feel like, Dave, running between uh, all the courses and, and taking care of your, your uh, flock of students and, and community members that you mentor and you, you help. And uh, Dave's an, um, an advisor, a mentor, one of my best friends, and uh, has been incredibly helpful to me. What I love about Dave, if you notice the friends he listed off that he brought in this class, they are all probably 10 to 20 years younger than Dave. Uh, when we get together at... Hey, hey. Eh. <laughs> 30, 40, <laughs> uh, to Dave. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I've learned the most about Dave, from Dave is the idea of surrounding yourself with, with, with brilliant people that inspire you every day, but to not be afraid if those people are look different from you, not to be afraid to, to reach out to people that aren't like you or maybe don't look like you or sound like you or, or, or in the same sort of age bracket of you that you can learn. There's mutual learning that goes on between uh, all of the wise experience that Dave has and, and, and sometimes, uh, especially when we first met 10 years ago, the spunk and energy and complete naivety I had of how this stuff works. Uh, and I love about this class, thank you for all the folks who are not of traditional college age or who are not getting a professional college credit for this, for being in this class, because you're a gift to the students, you're a gift to me as a speaker, uh, and I, uh, I'm sure that you will get gifts back from that experience, so thank you for being here, I'm really excited about that. All right, I understand that it is like the perfect weather outside right now, and I understand that Dave does not take attendance, I also understand that this class, uh, it has fairly light assignments when it comes to exams and when it comes to uh, sort of 
book reading necessarily. I also understand a bunch of you could be, uh, are not in this class and came to either hear me speak or to watch me fall apart on stage. Uh, there's many other places that you can be. Uh, I understand that. I uh, actually right now I was thinking about skipping because it was so nice outside, but I decided I'd commit it to you. So to thank you for making the journey here, to thank you for coming in, uh, for the folks who are, who are not, again, traditional college students who are here, you, I'm sure there are many things that you could be doing. Instead, you've chosen to listen to me. So to thank you all for that, I'm just going to start with a quiz. Does that seem like a fair, <laughs> fair thing? All right, get out a piece of paper and a pen. If you don't have one, you can do this on your iPhone or a piece of paper. Here's the quiz. Who, how many people have heard me give this how and why to travel around the world speech? Oh, good. Oh, good. I can, there's a couple people who have been here before. I'm going to try to keep it interesting. All right. I need you to draw. Here's the, here's the game. I need you to draw nine dots that look like this on your piece of paper. You can do this with your finger or your virtual pencil. What I want you to do is pick one of the dots, and I want you to draw a line. In fact, I want you to draw four straight lines, and I want you to connect all of the dots. Okay? So I want you to connect all the dots without lifting your pen, pencil, virtual. So let me just show you. So if you pick the dot here, and then there's one line, there's two lines, there's three lines, there's four lines. The goal is connect all the dots without lifting your pencil. If you get it, raise your hand. If you've seen it before, sit on your hand and let the rest of us discover. Uh, but let's see, if you do get it, raise your hand. And uh, I'll give you maybe, we'll start with 30 seconds and see where it goes. Nine dots on a piece of paper. Start with the draw, dot, draw four straight lines, connect all the dots. And raise your hand if you get it. You can come in, Andrew. There's like seats down here, people in back. You're welcome to come in. We should like scoot in a little bit if there's room. Okay, 15 seconds. Anybody got it who hasn't seen this before? Really? Oh, you've all seen it. Oh, okay. I see that. That's clever. That's clever. Okay, should I just show you? Because you're like, oh, I thought I just had to listen to this. Okay, should I show you? Did anybody get it? All right. Dave told me that this is actually the smartest classroom of people on the entire campus. Okay, should I just show you guys what you want to see? Okay, one, two, three, four. Piece of cake. Oh, wait, someone was like, wait, let me see that again. I saw your face. Okay, one, two, three, four. Easy. Now, how come in the room that is the smartest campus, room on campus, and you're all very intelligent looking people at least, why did you not get that? Why was that so hard? Shout it out. Afraid to go out of the boundary. Yep. Okay, so don't think outside the box. All right, so um, 30, <laughs> wow. Uh, less than one hour ago, I was in Cornell. I raced here all the way down Highway 1. I came all the way down. I, I had to scramble for parking. There was all these people watching. Dave invited me in. I'm following a guy who's raised $27 million next week. He's, he's speaking, Nate Staniforth, who literally makes things disappear, is speaking. Uh, you've heard from like world famous storytellers and acrobats and all this other stuff. If, <laughs> If I did all that running around and I came to stand right here and you all did all the things you did this morning to be here and my message was essentially think outside the box, I mean that'd be a fine message because it's true, <laughs> that would be the dumbest way for me to start a talk because, I mean you already know that, right? Like if I came all the way here and you all prepared and I literally walked out like today, I'm going to talk to you about thinking outside the box. So I'm not actually going to talk about that today but that is important. My message is slightly different and my message is not you need to think outside the box. My message today is maybe there is no box. Hmm. And here's what I mean by that. So I said there's nine dots, draw some lines. You all in this room who hadn't seen this before drew an artificial set of boundaries. You made a decision, I said nothing about it, about some imaginary line that you couldn't cross. You all just generally agreed upon it. You didn't even talk about it, right? And, and we do that, what I've learned in my life and my travels and, 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 our, and our folks who are, who are uh, esteemed members of our community have been around a little longer than students, you, you, you've seen this too, right? We, in our lives, draw boundaries around what we think is possible in our lives, even when there's no boundaries there. We contain our lives inside of boxes, even when there's no boxes. So today, I'm going to talk about my four-year, 40-country trip around the world, a trip I took almost immediately following college. I'm going to tell you how I did that. But what I want you to think about in this is that there are boxes that we draw around ourselves, boundaries that we assume are there that are not there. And today I want to convince you in telling you that story that there is a box, most of you, particularly the students, the young students, you have drawn a box around your life and you don't even realize you've done it. And today my job in hopefully uh, communicating to you, if I do a good job, is to convince you that the box that you've drawn doesn't actually exist. Right? That's my goal. And so 
to make this a lot easier, I'm just going to show you the box before we start my talk, and then you'll know what we're, we're, we're going to go after, and then I'm going to try to convince you that it doesn't exist. Okay? Does that sound fair? Is there any uh, physics or geometry majors? Okay, so the box is actually a line, so you're going to totally flip out when I say this, but the, b <laughs> the box that we're talking about is actually a line. Let me show you the line. Here's the line. This is the line of how life works. Right? This is the way life works. So you're born, uh, then you sort of start crawling, and then somewhere you start talking, and then you're walking, and then you go to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, junior high, high school, college. Everyone in this room who is a student at the university, you're batting 100% right now. You're doing very well. 100%. What happens after we go to college? What's the next dot? Get a job, right, and then you find a spouse, and then you adopt a dog, because that's what people do. And then you buy somewhere in there a big TV. And then you have a house to, for the TV. And then you have to get a bigger TV, you have a bigger house. And then eventually you have a big house because you have kids. And the kids go first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, junior high, high school, college, job. And the cycle repeats itself, right? And that, my friends, is how life works. <laughs> Everyone who's like not 22 is like, <laughs> little do they know. You guys should come up and, and, and help me, help me ex communicate this. So, so all of us have been led to believe by our culture that this is way, the way life works. I want to convince you today that this line is not real. It doesn't exist. I mean, certainly if you want to live on that line, you could try really, really hard. <coughs> Perfectly OK with me. But I want to convince you that this line isn't real. This line doesn't exist. It's not actually there. And that pre no one, no one, and I've got some folks who can check me on this, no one actually lives a life that looks like that. No one, OK? What I want you to understand about this principle, as I'm talking about this particular box, is that despite what we're told, life is organic, not linear. Life twists and turns and comes back on itself and sometimes halts and then goes faster. It is not this linear line where we're just checking off the boxes until we get to some imaginary uh, endpoint in which we win life at the end. That's what I want to communicate today. About 97% of you, we just met. So uh, it would be really rude of me to come in here and tell you how to live your life. So I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I uh, subscribe to the Dave Gould uh, School of Learning About Life, which is tell people your story, learn from other people's stories. And so today, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my story. So. I uh, studied filmmaking at the University of Iowa in this very building. I, I think my first college class was actually in this room, Becker 101. I spent a lot of time in this room watching film. And because I was a filmmaker, I love telling stories. So today I'm going to tell you uh, four stories. Four stories from my life that got me from being, being, a, being a young guy uh, in, in actually grade school to uh, being able to travel around the world for four years through 40 different countries. Four stories, that's it. That's all. You can take what you will from it, and I will definitely have you out of here before the bell rings. <laughs> Bells anymore uh, for class. <laughs> Does that sound good? Four stories? I'll just tell you four stories. And, 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 and the goal of the stories is, is primarily to be entertaining. Uh, I'd like to make you laugh a little bit. If I'm good enough today, I might communicate a little more, something a little deeper, or you might take something a little bit away that might help you in thinking about what you're going to do in your own life. Does that sound good? Four stories? Pretty straightforward? Okay, now, before we do the first story, you have to understand, now some people in this room know me, but some of you don't, so you have to understand a really important thing about me before I dive into the first story. Okay, so when you tell people that you've traveled around the world for four years through 40 different countries, almost entirely overland and on public transportation, um, the first thing most people say when you tell them that is, cool, that is cool. It is, it is cool to travel around the world for four years. But what <laughs> What's really important to understand before I get into the first story is that um, you have to understand. So, so traveling around the world for four years is cool. Me, Andy Stoll, not actually that cool. Okay, so traveling around the world is cool. Andy, not actually that cool. So let me explain. So in third grade, my mother sent me to. <laughs> I still have a problem saying this. Like I do this all the time. I can. In third grade, my my mother sent me to self-esteem camp. <laughs> it's, it's okay. You can laugh. I take it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my brother went to sand volleyball camp that summer. I went to self-esteem camp. Actually, I'm not making this up. In fourth grade, my mother sat me down on the edge of the bed on the first day of summer, and she said, Andy, this summer you're going to make one new friend. Because I had one other friend. My new friend was Jeff. We hung out for three months. 
never seen him since, and he's definitely never friended me on Facebook. Um, I was what I would call an invisible student. So I wasn't the quarterback of the football team, the smartest kid in the class. I also wasn't the kid that was constantly under the teacher's thumb or like out smoking cigarettes by the dumpsters. Do people still do that? Anyway, that wasn't me. If you ask most people I went to grade school with, like if you showed them a picture today and you're like, hey, remember Andy Soule when he was grade school with them? They would go, no, I don't. Who is this? <laughs> Suffice it to say that I was an incredibly shy, quiet child. Uh, I spent most of my middle school, junior high playing sports. I love sports. I love playing sports. Generally keeping to myself. That all changed um, my sophomore year in high school, which is the first of the four stories that I want to tell you today. So I was in geometry class. I was sitting next to this guy named Mike. Uh, Mike leaned over to me one day and handed me a petition and asked me to sign it. And Mike was, come on guys, um, Mike was running for the student council uh, in our high school. And he had to collect some signatures to get on the ballot, so he asked me to sign it. And as I handed it back to him, he said to me a really, really <laughs> funny thing. He said, uh, you should think about running for student council, Andy. You'd be, you'd be really good. Now let me help you understand where I was at at that point in my life. Um, if I had run for student council at that point, and let's say there were 32 people running, I would have probably come in 33rd if there was like an election. I don't even know how that works, but that's how, that's how, it, would have, that's how it would work. Um, so I dismissed the thought, passed the petition back to Mike, and went on about my day. You guys can like come in, sit down here. Uh, there's a couple seats over here, like really no problem, seriously. Um, so a couple days later I was watching television. It was a presidential election year, similar to the one we just, you know, are going starting beginning now. And you guys know how it works. It's like negative ad, negative ad, negative ad, negative ad, negative ad. Like that's how it goes, right? And you all are, live in Iowa, so you understand this profoundly, which is like it's super frustrating to watch television around an election time because you just only want to watch the t you don't want to watch TV. So I was 15 years old, I was watching this, and I had at this moment of negativity just this stupid idea, which is wouldn't it be funny if somebody ran for public office but they hired someone and they made a funny political ad? Think about it. You lived in Iowa, you've literally seen 100,000 political ads in your life, you have never ever seen a funny one. Didn't make any sense to my 15 year old mind. So my theory was that if someone made a funny political ad, they would just win. Because the rest of us are just freaking tired of it, right? So that's one of those ideas you have all the time, like wouldn't it be funny or wouldn't it be interesting? And then you go on about your day, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. So there I was, I was thinking about it in the shower, I was thinking about it on the bus, I was thinking about it on soccer practice. And for whatever reason that week, two ideas, for whatever reason, two ideas from that week, they just collided in my brain. And I decided, I had a really dumb idea. And I decided that I would run for student council in my high school, but as a joke, and I would make a funny political camp, uh, poster, and my two friends would think it was hilarious, and then like, I would, it would be like an elbow in the side of the establishment, the popular kids, I would mock their election. So, I'm gonna do it. So, we, I, got, I called my two friends, my only two friends, and I invited them over to my house, and uh, we dressed up like fishermen, and one of my friends had a camera. Uh, let me explain. So, Back in the day, when I was in high school, it was the 1990s, some of you may remember this, there was a uh, series of television commercials uh, for Bud Light. And the way, it wa the way it worked is there was an adult son and his sort of elderly father, and they're fishing, and they're on a lake, and it's misty, and there's loons, sentimental music's playing, and, the s and they're drinking Bud Light. And the son looks at his dad, and, and he says, Dad... You're such a great dad, and you've always been there for me, dad, and you just, I mean, you just have always supported and encouraged me, dad, and you know what? I love you, man. Sentimental music, loons, mist, comic pause, and then the father looks at his son and goes, son, you're not getting my Bud Light. <laughs> Humor was totally different in the 90s. Some of my friends here will, like, he, that would have killed in this room in the 90s. Um, so... <laughs> We dressed up like fishermen, we took a bunch of pictures, we decided we'd make a comic book style poster uh, uh, of this, uh, sort of like this, and it was a picture of, the pictures were like me and my friend Roger, and we're sitting there and I said to Roger, uh, Roger, you've been a great friend, a really good friend, you've always been there for me, Roger, and you know what? I love you, man. And then the last box of the poster is Roger looking at me saying, you're not getting my vote for student council, Andy. Humor was totally different in the 90s. <laughs> the cat videos have killed you all. These, like the humor, the internet has wrecked you. So uh, I take these posters, I go to Kinko's, I make a bunch of copies, and now I gotta hang them up, right? 
So I wait. I'm so nervous. I wait till the last minute. I sneak into my high school absolutely the last moment. Week before the election, Friday, it's like 6.30. Everyone's gone. The buses have left. The athletes are gone. There's like uh, a janitor and like a piece of paper blowing down the hallway. Like that's it. So I sneak into my high school and I run around with these posters and I pin them up next to the legitimate student council posters. It's like, where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> it's terrible. Sorry if will, if you're in the room, but that's terrible. Um, but like my poster is the alternate. Um, and I remember walking out of the school uh, a little bit later that evening and just feeling like a million dollars. Like I had had this idea in my head and I turned it in this thing and I went and I did it and I felt pretty damn good and my two friends are going to think it's hilarious. So Monday rolls around and just to understand where I was at, I had sort of forgot that I had done this at this point, because the point was to just do it, right? Like, so I walked in my high school, 7.30 in the morning, coming in from the parking lot, and I walk in the front door, and <laughs> immediately, I just knew something was totally different, and I was trying to figure out was a good or a bad thing, I'm sort of looking around, and I realized everyone was looking at me, right? So the invisible student was invisible no more. And I'm trying to decide if this is a good or a bad thing, and this guy, Billy, who's in one of my classes, comes running down the stairs, and he goes, Andy Stoll, I love you, man! And he gives me this really big hug. <laughs> And if there was ever a point in my life that I could have bought popularity, it was then. And it cost a dollar a poster at Kinko's. The more I printed, the more popular I became. It was amazing. <laughs> and um, the moment I really knew I made it, it was Thursday of the election week. And I was, I was walking to class, and there was this group of senior class cheerleaders. You know what I mean? Like, you all know, like, tall, blonde, beautiful, they smell good, like that group of women. <laughs> and I'm, I'm walking to class, and uh, Tiffany, and I'm... I, I am not, this is a true story, Tiffany, the captain of the senior class cheerleading squad, sees me. And she goes, hey, you're Andy Stoll. And I look at her and I go, hey, Tiffany, I, I know we've never really talked before, but um, are you going to be, what are you doing after the game on Friday? That's, <laughs> you know that's not what I said. Because, is it that, okay. So that's what I should have said. That's what I should have said. I think what I actually did was squeak. I think I went, <laughs> me, and then dropped my books. <laughs> Thank you. My self-esteem is strong. <clears throat> and she, I kid you not, she comes over and she goes, Andy Stoll, I love you, man. And she gives me this really big hug. And I can just like smell her perfume. And it was like the most beautiful moment in my life. In fact, I can smell it now. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> so where are we at? Okay, so then election day comes, the following day. I'm leaving school at 3.30. I'm walking out the door, and Mike, the guy from geometry class, sees me, and he goes, hey, Andy. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, listen, you should look at the uh, election results. You might find them interesting. And I remember thinking, he said that to me, and I remember thinking, like, the actual thought that went through my mind was like, dude, I hugged Tiffany. Like, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, so I walk over to this, this trophy case, piece of paper taped on it, 32 names, because there's 32 people running in my class. Um, they're taking 10 people, two alternates, 12 people in total. So I scroll down to my name, and there's a 12 next to it. So I had made it on the student council. And I'm standing in this hallway. I'm 15 years old. I'm this, this shy, quiet teenager. And I'm standing in front of this trophy case in my high school with this thing in my name and a 12 and this idea that you know, I'm now on the student council. And I'm looking at it, and there's all this activity because it's Friday, and everyone's trying to get home or get to the, you know, the football game and stuff. And I'm looking at this thing, and there's just one single thought that's sort of just one that's just in my brain as I'm trying to process what exactly this means. And that single thought is, oh, shit. <laughs> What have I got myself into? Because I wasn't, like, I wasn't supposed to win. Like, I didn't even know what the student council did. Like, I don't know. They're students and they council. Like, I have no idea. Like, I was mocking the system. I was not trying to join the system. <laughs> and I'm standing here looking at this, and I'm like, oh, jeez. So they sent me to um, student council camp, <laughs> which is only slightly cooler than self-esteem camp. <laughs> Jokes aside, it was a leadership camp. It was five days over the summer. And um, what I learned going to that was, one, that if I spoke up, people would listen, that my jokes were sometimes funny, and that if I wanted to be a leader, people would actually follow. Um, that was the first time in my life, also, that I realized that I had agency. And what I mean by that is that I could have an idea in my head of a thing I wanted to do, and then I could actually just go do it. And everything in my life from that point forward up to traveling around the world has essentially been just a bigger and bigger and bigger version of making a student council poster. 
That was also the first time in my life where my life was like going this way, this way, this way, this way, life was good, the plan's going good, and suddenly, whoop, out of nowhere, we were just going in another direction, right? I went on to get heavily involved in my high school uh, student council and in a couple other places. By the time I graduated, I was the vice president of the student council uh, when I graduated three years later. So some of you are taking notes. I remember not liking taking notes, so I'm just going to give you the notes um, here. But here's the two big lessons I learned from this particular story. The first is to make a change in your life, you have to put yourself out there. I really learned that. And what I mean by that is a lot of us want a different life than the life we want now. But a lot of us sit around and we're like, well, I'm just going to wait here and then eventually, boom, this new life's going to fall in my lap. What I've come to learn and what I learned in that story is, is that's not how it works. Like if you want a different life than the life you want now, you just got to do something. You got to put yourself out there. And for me, it was just like making this poster and doing something funny that I thought was funny, right? But for you, I don't know what that is, but you got to do something, right? If you want a different new life. The second lesson is follow your fascinations and interesting things will happen. So, so what I mean by that is, well, let's ask this. What's a fascination? So the way I think about a fascination is a fascination is a thing you're like, you, you, you like, you think you're into, kind of interesting, curious about, you kind of like playing with it, not quite sure what it is. So a lot of people that talk like me and look like me that are on the college lecture circuit to travel around and give talks say this thing all the time. And it's very true. It's, it, follow your pas passions. Your dreams will come true. And I think that's very true. And anyone who's done that knows that's true. My problem at 20 or 19 or 18 or definitely at 15 was like, how the hell do I figure out what I'm passionate about? Like, is that like a thing? Like, is there an office on the campus that can help me find that? Like, I could just like grab one before, oh my gosh, before they run out, like I'll go get one. Can you buy one at a store? Is there like a book I can read about it? Like, is there a test I can take? Like, how can I figure out what my passions are? Like, I don't know, right? And so what I've come to learn is that start out with your fascinations. These are, again, the things you want to sort of play with. Like, oh, I kind of like live music, or uh, I'm kind of into like computers, or computer programming, or I like dancing, or I sort of like writing, right? Is it my passion? I don't know, but I kind of like it. And what, I'm, what I really learned from this is you got to play with it. you got to do something, and interesting things will happen. Notice it's not follow your fascinations and your dreams come true, because that's, I don't, I don't know, if I can't promise that. But interesting things will happen. And what I've come to learn in the 20 years since this particular story happened is that fascinations, if pursued and played with, become passions or can become passions. But they start out as just sort of a seed of a, hmm, that's interesting. So as you're writing and thinking about this class, you know, for those of you who are like, oh, I don't know, I, I want to find my passions because I know that's a lesson that you hear a lot in this class is, I don't know how to do that. Start with the fascinations. What are the things that you sort of like playing with and then just go play with them? For me, when I was 15, I love being funny, I love telling stories, and I love being creative. And you can see that manifested itself in a really weird student council poster. But interesting things certainly happened. All right, that's the first story. Second story, how many people are freshmen in here, first year students? OK, you're going to relate to this one. All right, so get to the end of college. What's the next thing on the line? Well, sorry, you get to the end of high school. What's the next thing on the line? Go to college. Go to college. So they told me I had to go to college. They also told me in order to go to college, I had to pick a major. So I thought about it, and I rolled it over my mind and I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. I was going to make movies. I wanted to live in Southern California. I wanted to do work with Steven Spielberg and I wanted to hang out with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I don't know why I just said that, but I associate Southern California very deeply with Snoop Dogg, I, I guess. And so I did some research. Turns out the number one school in the country for filmmaking is USC, the University of Southern California, the Trojans, right there in Los Angeles, California. It is the Harvard Law of Film Schools. That's where I was going to go. I spent my entire senior year jumping through every single hoop. That it's one of those schools that has ridiculous amounts of hoops to get into. And so uh, like eight essays, uh, donate a kidney, translate the works of Shakespeare into Hindi. Like I did it all. <laughs> I did it all, didn't complain. January of my senior year, I got a letter from the University of Southern California. It said, congratulations, Andy Stoll. You have been accepted. You are now, a, you are going to be a Trojan. And it was the best day of my life because everything that I had worked for, everything I had gunned at, everything I had sacrificed for was coming true. And my entire life was set because I was going to go to the University of Southern California, move to Los Angeles. I was going to study with the best filmmakers in the country. I was going to bump into Steven Spielberg and Snoop Dogg and George Lucas. And I was going to have a life in the Hollywood that ended in the Hollywood Hills with martinis hanging out with uh, Brad Pitt or whoever it is at the time. And my life was beautiful. So I went out. I bought a sweatshirt to signal that to the world. It said USC <laughs> Trojans. And I wore that sweatshirt every single day uh, from there on out. 
Then May 1st came, National Canada Decision Day. Some of you may know of this day. The really competitive schools, you have to declare on May 1st where you're going to go, and then we play musical colleges and everyone sits down and hopefully everyone has a college. So May 1st came, I walked downstairs from my bedroom to have breakfast with my parents, as I did every morning, and my dad was, and my mom were sitting there, and my dad looks at me and says, Andy, today we are going to decide where you're going to college. And I said, well, Dad, I'm going to USC. And my dad said, hmm, do you have $150,000? And I was like, no, no, but we'll borrow it, Dad, student loans, student loans. It's like, student loans are like a great investment. And he said, okay. Kind of looks at my mom, he sort of looks at the ground, and then he takes a really deep breath, and he goes, I know this is your dream, and I know you worked really, really hard to get into USC, and that's where you really want to go, but your mom and I have been talking, and even with the financial aids and the grants and, and everything, we just don't think our family can afford to send you to USC. My entire life, which was projected out until death in the Hollywood Hills of Southern California, in one instant with like, my fa our family can no longer, or we do not believe our family can afford to send you. My entire life, everything around me, my entire existence collapsed in like two seconds. And I was pissed. Like I got super angry. I started yelling at my dad. I yelled at my mom. I was freaking angry at USC. I was mad at Snoop Dogg. I was just pissed. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the summer just furious at the world, right? Now the thing to understand where I was at at that point was I was so sure that's what I was going to do. I, <laughs> didn't have a backup school. I had applied nowhere, nowhere else. One of my favorite pieces of advice from Nate Staniforth is the problem with the plan B is they work, <laughs> right? So my plan was there was gonna be no plan B, right? So I had nowhere to go to college. It's May 1st. So my mother was telling this story to someone else at her work. I grew up in Omaha, about four hours west of here. And uh, she mentioned to some lady at work. And the lady at work says, oh, well, you know, the University of Iowa has a film program. So my mom comes home and she tells me this. And this audience will appreciate this. <laughs> I, what I, my response when she said that was, I was like, I do not want to be a cyclone. Because like, I didn't even understand there was another state university in Iowa in the city called Iowa City. Like, I didn't even know it was a place, right? Like, it had never, the Hawkeyes, because we were like Big Ten, or we were like Big 12, and it was a totally different football conference. I had no idea there was even a school called the University of Iowa. But, thank you, University of Iowa, if there's any admissions folks in there. The University of Iowa accepts uh, applications until about June 15th. So a tour was arranged, a tour was had. I came to campus right here in Iowa City. It was fine. I think I filled the application out at the end of the tour and I was received acceptance that I would attend the University of Iowa. 37 or uh, 37,000 students in the middle of a cornfield which couldn't possibly be further from LA or Hollywood <laughs> in my mind and I spent the entire summer just miserable, mad, angry, frustrated. My entire life was in the shitter is basically how it felt like, and it was probably over. So the other thing that happens, um, and you guys, some of you know this, is when you come to the University of Iowa, a little short on dorms around here, if you apply June 15th, they run out of dorm rooms, so they say, well, I'm sorry, um, we don't have a dorm room for you, but um, we do have this temporary housing, and it's a closet up in Burge Hall, where they uh, take you and nine other people that applied for college June 15th, and they put you in there, and they're like, you should all bring alarm clocks, all 10 of you, and you should set them at different times, and you should all sleep in this closet together. So there I was, first day, of, first day of classes, first weekend, I came to Iowa City. I was miserable, absolutely miserable. I came here, um, I had these 10 roommates or nine roommates in this closet in Burge Hall, the 3500s. And um, I walked in, I tried to play cool, right? I walked in, I was like, hey guys, what's up? How's it going? Hey, nice to meet you all. I'm looking forward to it. We should hang out. Totally, yeah, definitely. And then I immediately, my parents had just dropped me off. I immediately turned back around, walked outside, got in my car, and just started driving north. Now, I do not cry. I am not a crier. I have cried three times in my life, and one of those is Dead Poets Society. We're going to save that for another talk. <laughs> And I just bawled my brains out. And I drove, there's a lake up there. Did you know if you keep driving? I was like, so lake me bright. Oh my God, it's so beautiful, but I'm so pissed at the world. And um, I was miserable, absolutely miserable. Um, I decided about three days into college that I was here for at least a semester, if not a year, if not longer. So I had to do something. And in high school, getting involved helped me a lot. So I said, okay, I'm going to join, I'm going to do something. And I love sports, so I joined the crew team. They let you row boats here without any pre qualifications. It's amazing. And there I was, rowing on the river with boats and large oars and doing all sorts of things. And, and you know, to be honest with you, it helped. It helped because I had a little group and we hung out for a couple weeks and, um, you know, or we for the first couple weeks of school and that, that was good. So about 
three weeks, two weeks into school maybe, I, was, I walked into my temporary housing closet room, whatever it is, and this guy Chris, who's one of my temporary housing roommates, which I kid you not, was from LA and came to Iowa to school, which, pff, talk about irony. <laughs> I walk in the room and Chris is like, hey, Andy, I'm gonna go down to the student union. We're gonna go to, I'm gonna go to the student activities fair. Do you wanna go? And have you guys been to this thing? It's like over at the IMU or maybe it's somewhere else now, but the all student groups try to recruit you. And I didn't really want to go. Like, I was on the crew team, like, whatever, not a big thing. But um, Chris was honestly my only friend at that point. And the freshman in the room might be feeling that. You know, like, you're, like the first couple of months, you're like, I have two friends. Um, so I was like, okay, cool, I'll go, but I don't really want to go. But mostly I just go in to hang out with Chris. So, so we end up going down there. We're walking through the aisles. There is like 10 million student uh, groups on this campus. And we're walking around, and this really enthusiastic young woman leaps out in front of us. She's like, are you guys freshmen? And we're like, it's that obvious because you know freshmen they think oh I look all old but they're carrying the yellow bags they're carrying the yellow stop <laughs> carrying the yellow bags yeah <laughs> freshmen if you're carrying a yellow bag stop <laughs> so uh, she says listen I have an amazing opportunity for you the university student government has a brand new program the first 10 students who are freshmen who take this petition and go get 300 signatures from 300 other freshmen and turn them in get to be representatives for the freshman class on the entire university student government and I remember thinking like, mm, okay, cool, thanks. And she, but she was really, like I wasn't interested obviously. And I had actually made a decision because I had done student council before, I didn't want to do that in college, I would do something different. But she was so enthusiastic, she's like, and handed us a petition, so I was like, okay, thanks. Put it in my bag, and it was like, go find free food, right? Because that's what you, you, know, you do. And um, got back to the room later that evening, Chris is sitting there when I walk in on his bed, and he has a super sneaky look on his face. I was like, What's up? And he goes, listen, Andy, remember that petition from earlier? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, listen, I got a plan. You're going to run for the student government, and I'm going to be your campaign manager. <laughs> so, Sorry? And he's like, listen, listen, this is good. Now, the thing I didn't tell you is that our temporary housing closet room with 10 other dudes, they happened to put it at the end of a woman's floor in Burge. So outside of my door, there is literally 45 women, who would, freshman women, who had just moved in. And so Chris is like, listen, you're going to run for the student government. I'm going to be your campaign manager. We've got to collect these uh, signatures, so we're going to go door to door to door, and we're going to meet the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Chris, that is brilliant. Let's go, dude. <laughs> and so we run out, and Chris is good. Like, we knock on the door, and he, like, opens up. And he's like, hey, Kelly, my name is Chris. I want you to meet Andy Stoll. He lives down at the end of the hallway. He is going to be your next representative for the University of Iowa student government freshman class. Wouldn't it be great to have a guy like that on the floor? <laughs> Women were super nice. They're like, yeah, that, that's, that's cool. What do you need? And Chris would be like, listen, here's what we need. We've got to get some signatures. So we got this petition. So first column, if you just write your name, second call you, column, you sign it. And then you see we added a column for phone numbers. So if you could just fill that in, and we'll be on our way. <laughs> and we just went down and met the ladies. Chris would do this thing where we'd get into one of the rooms, and he'd be talking. And then he'd look at me and go, Andy, listen, I'm going to talk to Emily and see if she has any uh, constituent needs. Why don't you go on to the next room? <laughs> this is because we were college freshmen, no offense, college freshmen males, but you just don't like have the regular ability to just walk up to a female and have like a normal conversation. Um, so <laughs> the next day I was walking to class, and I, no joke, I'm walking to class, I walk by the cafeteria. Chris is in the cafeteria at a table of beautiful women. He has the petition and he's passing it around. I'm not even there. Like he is passing the petition around collecting signatures. And so a couple of days, maybe the next day, Chris comes into the room and he just bump, drops on my bed literally 500 signatures in these petitions. <laughs> so I was like, what is it? And I looked at him, I flipped through, it was all women, like not a dude signed the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt sort of bad because I didn't realize we were like doing it for serious. So I was like, well, I should probably just mail it in because Chris did all this work. So I mailed it and completely forgot about it. About three weeks later, I get a phone call from a very enthusiastic woman who says, is this Andy Stoll? And I was like, yes, it is. And she's like, hi, this is Jess from the student government. I'm calling to say congratulations. You have been selected to be one of the 10 representatives on the University of Iowa freshman class. And I was like, who is this? And she goes, she goes, she goes, uh, you submitted some signatures, a petition with the, I'm like, oh, the ladies. I mean, the students. Yes, the signatures. Like, yes, totally. Yes, I know what I'm talking about. Yes, yes. She's like, congratulations. I'm like, great. And then she's like, you got to come to a meeting. And I was like, ah. Oh. I was like, fine, I'll go to the meeting. So I went to the meeting. It was fine. There were nine other people there. I was fully intent walking to that meeting that I was going to quit because I was a film major. I, it's not a thing I wanted to do. 
Uh, I was on the crew team. I forgot to tell them, oh, I'm busy with school and the crew team. I'm going to quit. But I walked in. There were nine other people who were super excited. They were like, oh, my God, we're representatives on the freshman, freshman class, blah, blah. They were so excited. But by the end of the meeting, I was kind of like, this might be like a thing. Like, this might be a thing. So I, like, couldn't quit. Like, I literally was just like, I can't. Not, at least not in front of these guys, right? Like, I can't quit. So I kept going to meetings. And they were fine. Perfectly acceptable meetings. Not that exciting. Not that terrible. They were fine. Now, the plot twist. They eventually got me out of that closet. They put me in a dormitory called Mayflower out uh, at the edge of campus. It's about a 10, 15 minute bus ride depending on the day. So after every single student government meeting, I had to take the bus to get home. Now, there was another woman on the student government whose name was Lana Zack. Well, Lana is now a <laughs> seven time Emmy Award winning producer for ABC News. I had just met her, though, at the time. And she was an RA in, in the building, and I was obviously a resident. She was on the student government. So after every student government meeting, we had to take this bus out to Mayflower. And just because of the nature of things, we became friends. About four months later, Lana pulled me aside one day and she said, Andy, I don't know if you know how it works here at the university, but every year someone runs to be student body president and student body vice president. And they have six people on their ticket that represent each different class in the two graduate colleges, or two of the graduate colleges. And I, Lana Zach, am going to run to be student body president and I have a running mate who's vice president and we need a freshman representative on the ticket and I think that guy is you. <coughs> I was like, me? Um, Lana, I'm a film major. Like, I don't really like politics or like stuff like that, but like, why would I want to do that? And so she's like, well, here's lots of reasons. And she started sort of listing these off and she was da 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 da. Now, I clearly must have like glazed over or something because her boyfriend, Seth, who was sitting right there, leans over and he goes, hey, Andy. I'm like, yeah. He goes, listen, uh, when I was a freshman, I ran to be on this, uh, I ran on a ticket. And let me tell you, this is a great way to meet girls. I looked at him and I was like, really? He goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Sign me up, I'm on, I'm on the ticket. <laughs> so I joined the ticket. So we got together this group, about eight, nine people, and then we started to build this team of like 100 people, putting together our student government campaign. Three days before the paperwork was due, we had to file for our election. Our vice president came to the team and said, I know I've been with you for a couple months in planning and making all this happen. I've decided, unfortunately, that I'm leaving your ticket. I'm forming another ticket, and I'm running against you. Lana goes into a tailspin. She'd either been playing this for a year, maybe three years, maybe her whole life. I don't really know. But she's like, oh, my God, oh, my God. We're, she's like, we're not going to give up. We're gonna, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. And she sort of runs away. Next morning, knock at my dorm room door at 8 o'clock. I usually don't get up that early. I open it's Lana. Her hair is like, it's like been mainlining Red Bulls and pulling her hair out all night. And she's talking like a crazy, crazy crackhead. She's like, oh, my God. And she comes. She's like, Andy, I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking, thinking this through. And I've thought it all the different ways. And I looked at all the scenarios. And I've been thinking about it. And I've been, I know what we're going to do. And I have a plan. And here's what we're going to do. We've been thinking about it. We've been discussing it. And I'm going to tell you the most obvious person to be the vice president on our ticket is you. <laughs> and I was like, how many Red Bulls have you had, Lana? Uh, I'm a freshman, fourth month of my freshman year, film major, not really feeling like that's a good fit. She's like, no, no, I thought it through. Here's why. Ah, da, 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 da. And she starts listing off all these reasons. Clearly, I was early. I probably looked glazed over. Anyway, her boyfriend, Seth, leans in at some point. He goes, hey, Andy, remember I said that was a good way to meet girls being on the ticket? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he goes, listen, being vice president as a freshman on a ticket? Oh, that's, that's a really good way to meet girls. I was like, really? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I was like, Sign me up, I'm in! So here I am, fourth month of my freshman year, I've decided to run for the student body vice president position here at the University uh, of Iowa. So we build a team of a couple hundred people. We run around, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, it's actually a really cool experience, but it is intense. Uh, you've got to raise a bunch of money, you take out ads, you take flyers, you go speak at Greek houses and student groups, it's sort of crazy. Election day comes, <laughs> we're over in the student union in a room about this size. Here's Lon and Andy, 200 people on our team. The other ticket, 200 people on their team. And here's the guy from the election council who gets up and says, hello, you're from the election council to, uh, to tell you the results of the student body president and vice president election here at the University of Iowa. And the winner is Lana Zach and Andy Stoll. And I remember at that moment, six months into my freshman year, when he said that, and I remember that our entire team, because they work really hard, right? And, and, and this like 150, 200 people like leaped up in the air simultaneously in spouts of joy and excitement and hugs and crying and all sorts of things. And it actually felt like for just a little moment, and I was sitting kind of right, you know, here, it felt like gravity had ended because it just was like the entire room went whoop behind me. And as the room went up and gravity disappeared, my entire body just began collapsing downward into my chair as everyone is leaping and screaming and I just sort of <laughs> into my hands 
And there is just one single thought at this point uh, that is going through my brain, which is, oh, shit. What have I got myself into now? Because we, we weren't going to win. I mean, six months into my freshman year, like, I'm a film major. What the hell just happened? But there I was, student body vice president, as a six months into my freshman year at the University of Iowa campus of 37,000 students. It ended up being a really, really hard job. It ended up being probably between 40 and 60 hours a week on top of my classes. The lucky thing was that Lana and her friends were there with me. They were older. They were two to three years older. They were more experienced leaders. They made me raise my game. They did a lot of coaching and teaching of me at that point. And I rose to the occasion, or at least I like to think I rose to the occasion. At the end of that, fresh, of that end of that first year, mostly because of my friend, encouragement from my friends and because of name recognition, I ran to be the student body president at the university and, uh, and won. Uh, so uh, my sophomore year, about 18 months into my college career at the University of Iowa, I was the student body president uh, of a campus of about 37,000 students. Now, here's the crazy thing about that story. If you had gone back to the me, the guy in the car crying, driving up north of town on the first day of college, running into a lake. If you had told that guy in 18 months, you will be the president of the student body here at the University of Iowa, that kid would have said, ha ha, there's two reasons why that's not going to happen. Number one, there is no way I can conceivably even trace a path that would get me from bawling in my car at the lake, at the edge of Lake McBride my first day of college to 18 months later, I would somehow be in this position. Like, there's just no, like, you can't, there isn't a path. You couldn't, if you had magic powers, you couldn't draw a path. But that doesn't even matter because the second reason is, I don't even want the job! Why would I want to be student body president at the University of Iowa? But there I was, before the, even the end of my sophomore year, uh, running the student government and representing the student body. That's the second story. Two lessons from that story, which still strike me today. Number one. Fake it till you make it. What I mean by that, what, okay, what I don't mean by that is lie, right? Like, oh, yes, doctor, I can do the surgery. Give me the scalpel. Like, I don't, <laughs> that's not what I mean. What I mean is that even if you don't believe that you can do something, when you start, there is an element of faking it. There is an element of when someone's like, well, you, you're, uh, you know, 20, 20 years old, and you can be the student body president at the University of Iowa. And even if your head, you're like, oh my God, no, I cannot. There's an element of like, yeah, I, I can figure that out. Absolutely, I can, I can figure that out. There's a level of confidence, right? And what it's become, what I've really come to understand and, and know is that when you start anything in your life, you're never quite ready to do it, right? Uh, my esteemed members of the community here are all nodding their head that when, when you start something, there's an element of faking it for everyone. And the thing that's interesting, like think about LeBron James, like, right, like probably one of the best athletes in the history of humankind, right? I guarantee you that the moment he stepped on that NBA court for the first time, there was some portion of his brain, even though outwardly he didn't show it, there was some portion of his brain that was like, oh my God, I should have gone to college. They're going to totally catch me. They, I don't know if I'm ready for this. I don't. I just, I don't. There was doubt. Like LeBron James doubted himself in stepping on the NBA court for the first time time, right? You, you, I think Seth Godin, who was on, uh, in town last week and has spoken at this class before, said, you're always prepared, but you're never ready, right? I think that's powerful, right? And so what I've come to really understand is that if, if you think about college and your career and the things you want to do with your life, if you want to be a dancer, there's never a point where you're like, well, I uh, read all the books on dancing. I have watched all the videos on dancing. I know all the history of dancing. I have interviewed all the dancers, and now I am ready to become a dancer. Like, that's not actually how it works. Entrepreneurship. You want to be an entrepreneur and start a business. It's like, well, I've read everything ever written about Steve Jobs, and I know everything about the business model canvas, and I know absolutely everything there is to know about starting a business. I have all the backup plans in place, and now I will start a business. That's just not how life works. When you start at the beginning, there is certainly an element of faking it. B.F. Burt, is he coming to class this time? B.F. Burt, who speaks at this course, said something in a lecture a couple semesters ago that always stuck with me that relates to this point, which is you never want to put yourself in a situation where someone else believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And believing in yourself at the beginning, it's not all confidence. It's a little bit of like, oh yeah, I totally, I can do that. <coughs> I can do that. I can learn. I can figure that out. So that's the first lesson for that story. The second lesson 
is you become who you surround yourself. This is the one piece of advice I wish I understood when I was 21, 22 years old here at the university. And what, I've heard it said in another way, is you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. What they say, there was a, a research study done uh, that if you take an adult who has a job and you take the five adults they spend the most time with, if you average the salary of the five adults around them, you actually generally get pretty close to that person's salary. Like, isn't that interesting? So the question to ask yourself and the question to think about is, who are the five people that you spend the most time with? A couple of you are like, whoa. The cool thing about college is, is, is there will never be a point in your life where you have more access to new people ever. Like you can just edit, change, come back to, return, push away. You're five people that you surround yourself. And it's so easy to go out and meet people. And some of the hardest things when you get older is you're like, oh, I need some inspiration. I need someone to, oh, where do I find those people? So for those of you in college, take advantage of that opportunity. The other thing for me, and really what drove it home for me, and, and all the athletes in the room will get this, is that Lana and her friends made me raise my game, right? Because I just had to be at their level. They were two or three years older than me. They were just better, more experienced people. But just like athletes, like if you're a basketball player, if you go out to play basketball with like four other people that are better than you, like you will just raise your game inherently by who's around you. So be purposeful in thinking about who you surround yourself and how you make that choice and recognize the opportunity in college to like really choose is amazing. I also wish I understood in college that the five people I surround myself with were going to be my best friends for the rest of my life and that the people you meet in college will spread out across the country and they'll go do amazing things and you'll always have that, that bond and that time to connect in college. Uh, there are two types of college students, I believe, particularly freshmen. There's those that stay in the dorm room and those that get out. At some point, if you're, a freshman, if you're a freshman, there will be a point, if you haven't had it already, you're going to be sitting in your dorm room and you're going to be hesitating. And you're going to think, ooh, why don't you just, well, Netflix is over there. Because there's a thing you want to go to, but you're nervous, or it doesn't seem like it's going to be right, or you, or you don't know what's going to happen. Hear my voice in your head at that moment, and hear me say, get out of the dorm room. I guarantee you interesting things will happen, or at least more interesting things than sitting and watching a House of Cards on Netflix. So it's a great show. All right, that's the second story. Third story, probably the one everyone wants to hear. So I graduated from the University of Iowa. I was 23 years old. I was bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. I wanted to change the world. I realized very quickly upon my graduation that I had a big problem. And the big problem was that I wanted to change the world, but I had absolutely no freaking clue how it worked because I spent my entire life living in the Midwest, basically with my head in books and watching documentaries and talking to people that look just like me. And I realized that it was egotistical, it was arrogant and, and, and of me to think that I could change the world having never actually seen it. I had actually never traveled outside of the United States. So I realized I had to fix that. So I looked around at all things you could do to travel after you graduate. You can do Peace Corps, you can do uh, Teach English in China, you can uh, backpack across Europe, you can volunteer at an orphanage in Costa Rica. Like there's lots of things you could do. So I looked at all these things and I was like, I cannot pick one of these. They all, okay, I'm going to do them all. I'm going to do them all. I'm going to take a trip around the world. So the problem was that I didn't have any money. Um, I owed the federal government about $25,000 in student loans, um, which if you think about it is actually a really good reason to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I took a really normal job, across the river, College of Public Health, fixing computers. Why fixing computers? Because I didn't love fixing computers and I knew I could quit. Gave myself a three-year deadline. At the end of three years, I would, whatever happened, I would go. I put aside a little bit of money each month. At the age of 26, almost three years to the day, I quit my job. I sold everything I owned. And with a backpack, a virgin passport, and a one-way ticket to China, I left. I had never been outside of the in-country in my entire life. And I was just scared. The purpose of the trip, which sounds sort of naive, is to go see how people live in the world, to live like the locals. The plan was to go around the world for a year. Four years later, I came back. I did all sorts of crazy, weird, interesting, odd things. I lived in a Buddhist temple in Korea. I worked in a dress factory in Bangkok making dresses for J.C. Penney. I worked in Bollywood. So I worked in three mo or two movies behind the scenes with my film degree in Bollywood. And then they recruited me to be in front of the camera in another movie, I Do Not Act. So I played a 19th century British soldier in one of the most expensive Bollywood movies ever made. 19th century British <laughs> soldier. <laughs> I lived in Zambia with a guy in, a, in his mud hut and he taught me how they farm maize. 
I lived on a 500,000 acre cattle ranch in Australia. Um, I worked on a team doing cataract surgeries in uh, the South Pacific in the really remote islands of Fiji. I did not do the surgeries. <laughs> I took pictures, but I was on the team. And it had all sorts of adventures. And I could sit here for hours, Dave will attest, and just tell you stories of funny things that happened or interesting things that happened. But instead of doing that, I'm going to show you a four minute video that captures my four year trip uh, around the world. <laughs> So I traveled around the world for four years through 40 different countries, almost entirely overland and on public transportation. And the single biggest lesson I learned is that cultural and language differences aside, we're all much more similar than we're led to believe. And it's the similarities that keep us connected and the differences that keep it interesting. 
The second very important lesson I learned, which is incredibly applicable to folks in this class, is that half of figuring out what you want to do in the world is figuring out what you don't. So uh, I will never be a monk. Monastic life is not for me. Uh, I can't really do anything with uh, my hands, like sewing. Uh, acting is definitely out. I don't want to live in a mud hut village. And definitely don't put me near your cattle or anything involving blood, because I'm either running away or on the floor. Now, I had four years to explore, to try many different things. Within that, I found a ton of things that I never, ever, ever want to do again. Within that, a subset of things that were fascinating, that were interesting to me. And then even within that, a subset, a very small sub subset of a couple things that I believe I am willing to spend the rest of my life pursuing. How many people in here don't have, are like a little unsure about what they want to do with their lives, regardless of your age, a little unsure, okay. So college students, statistically, statistics say 70% of you have no idea, uh, about 60% of you are willing to admit it. Um, and that's okay, that's perfectly okay. My four year trip around the world is very similar to a four year college education. The way to take advantage of it is just like a trip around the world, which is try a bunch of things. Sign up for courses that don't look like courses you think you might wanna take. Join student groups with people that don't look like you. Hang out with people that speak a different language than you. Talk to people that are older than you. Within that, you'll find a similar experience, I think, to me, which is you will find many things that, well, you know, you gave it a try, you don't want to try again. But within that, hopefully, a subset of things that you want to do or you might want to pursue for the rest of your life. Does anyone want to travel around the world like I did, take a backpack and go? All right, good. That's like almost the same percentage. <laughs> um, my last story I want to tell you before I wrap up here. Uh, some of you ask, usually at the end of the talks, uh, people ask me, what's it like to travel around the world? And so I'm going to tell you just one last story to give you a taste of what it's like. See, there's this whole network of hostels. Uh, there's a whole network of buses and trails and places and restaurants that these backpackers, thousands of them, traveling around the world. And I want to tell you a quick story to get you, help you understand what it is like to do that. So let's imagine we're in Berlin. Uh, Germany, right? And uh, we're at this hostel and we're going around, we're try I'm trying some, you know, different things and I run into a pretty girl. Pretty girl says to me, pretty girl says to me, hey, I'm going to go to Paris next week or this weekend, do you want to go? Now this is like this normally in backpacking things, even if you're traveling alone, you meet other people and then you connect with them and travel for a week or a month or sometimes a day and then you sort of go on your own way and she said I'm going to go to Paris and I was like, yeah, I'd like to go to Paris, that seems like a nice thing. I know what you guys are thinking, Paris, Eiffel Tower, wine, cheese. Yeah, that's Paris pretty much, that's pretty much Paris. So I, he's like, oh yeah, oh, wait, I gotta do this thing that, oh, I gotta do this thing on Saturday and I, I can't, I can't, well, she says, why don't you meet me there on Sunday? I'm like, okay, okay. So I go and I buy my train ticket and Saturday night I'm out in Berlin and I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying my time out and I stay out a little late and the next morning I get up and I'm a little tired and, and I come downstairs to the hostel and I bump into some people I know and I'm looking at my watch and I realize I'm gonna miss this train to go to Paris to see the girl with the wine and the cheese <laughs> and the Eiffel Tower, right? And so, so I'm sort of busting out there trying to get out and I get down to the taxi and the taxi driver doesn't speak English, I don't speak German, so it takes a little longer to explain which train I'm going to. And so I'm sort of pushing through and now I'm like looking and I'm getting anxious and I'm starting to sweat because I'm gonna miss my train to go to Paris uh, to see the girl with the wine and the cheese in the Eiffel Tower. And I get to the train station and I bust in the front door and this is when you realize when you walk in that they don't teach you in America how to use European train stations. Anyone's ever been there? You're like, what does all the numbers mean? And so you're running around and now I'm looking at the clock and I'm looking at the thing and my train's supposed to leave right now and I'm gonna miss this train to go to Paris see the girl with the wine and the cheese in the Eiffel Tower. And so I sort of push my way through and there's a blinking light and I move and I start pushing people out the way and I drive on the train and the door almost catches my backpack but I collapse in and I'm like, oh, I made it. Whew. I'm gonna go see that girl with the wine and the cheese in the Eiffel Tower and you're feeling pretty good about yourself and, and you start, you know, I walk in and I find my seat and I like collapse, I'm feeling good in the window, it starts, mo you know, it starts moving and outside the window I see Berlin and I'm feeling pretty good about myself and then the conductor comes on because this is Europe and they do the announcements in four languages and then the last one in this case was English. And the conductor says, all aboard Euro flight or Euro train 6429 bound for Budapest. <laughs> So let me just tell you and find yourself in the situation backpacking, no matter how loud you are, no matter how good you think your German is, they're not going to back that train up to back into the station to let you off to get on the actual train to go to Paris to see the girl with the wine and the cheese in the Eiffel Tower. Now what happens when you're in a situation like this, the first thing that happens, oh, there's a phases, the first or second time, it's like I can see the phases, the first time is you get super pissed. You're like, oh god, stupid train train, and everyone's like, oh, the Germans are like, crazy American. And you're like, oh, the stupid train, the taxi driver, the hostel, the traffic, oh, and you get so mad. That goes on for about two hours. Second phase, you start getting super mad at yourself. 
So you're like, oh god, I should have got up earlier, I should speak German, I should have used a train. And you beat yourself up for like two hours. And then if you get through that phase, there's a third phase. And the third phase is interesting because you realize you have a choice. And here is the choice. You realize that you can choose to be mad at your at the world, or you know, uh, uh, the trains, or the Germans, or Snoop Dogg about how you ended up on this train. <laughs> you can choose to be super mad at yourself for the choices you made that got you in this situation. But what I realized in doing this a couple times is that in that situation you have a choice. And the choice is if you choose to open your mind, if you choose to accept the fact that you are on a train that is moving forward to a destination that you do not control, and that if you choose to be open to the possibility of what might happen, once you figure out what country Budapest is in, and you get there, it turns out it's a pretty nice place. And the lesson, one of the biggest lessons from travel, and maybe one of the biggest lessons in life, turns out that you have to be prepared in life to wake up in Budapest. <laughs> because life can be going along, going, 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 and that's the plan, we're going here, and suddenly, whoop, you're gonna go this way, right? Because that's actually how life works. This is my life, what a freaking mess, it's not a line, it goes like this. If you don't believe me, here's my challenge and the last piece of homework before I wrap up here. Find one of the folks in here that are esteemed members of our community that have been around for more than 30 years on this planet, and I want you to ask them their story. Ask them how they got from college to being where they are. And they're going to not tell you a story that's a linear line. They're going to tell you the story that goes like this. It's going to be crazy. And I tell you all of this to tell you this, that all of this to tell you this. I am just a guy. I do not have magic powers. I do not have anything that you all didn't have. I was actually in your chair not long ago. And if a shy, quiet kid who went to self-esteem camp from <laughs> Omaha, Nebraska can live his life's biggest dream by the time that he is 30, uh, then I think that you can too. I want to leave you with this text. I found it in a magazine, and it says what I'm trying to say in way less words. The American dream is too small. It's not enough to be quarterback and marry the cheerleader and make senior VP and have the tiniest cell phone. It will be measured. By that, in, uh, or will not be measured by investment portfolios or personal fitness trainers. It will be measured by that tiny voice inside yourself that tells you what you're truly capable of. The American dream will always be there for you, but your own dream, if you listen, is much, much bigger. I think I'm gonna join Dave for coffee yep. up the hill at Teaspoons if you wanna hang out with me. Yeah, thanks for staying a couple of minutes. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. watching City Channel 4 on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.